Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, my question is directed to Senator Button, the Leader of the Government in the Senate, at least for this afternoon. And I, I refer the Minister to the imminent ballot for the leadership of the Labor Party and the Prime Minister of Australia. And I ask, wouldn't, wouldn't want to vote. What, adva what advantages would there be for Australia in the election of the architect of the recession, Mr Keating? And in the, and in the event of Mr Keating's success, what transitional arrangements have been made to govern this country, particularly bearing in mind the plight of almost one million unemployed Australians? The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. Mr. President, ever since I've been uh, here with this opposition, they always ask a question. Um, thank you, Senator. What was it? They, they, uh, they always ask questions about uh, uh, you know, what are the budget forecasts for next year and uh, what's going to happen next month and what's going to happen. Well, my position on all these things has always been that the government will do what is necessary and announce it at, announce it at their pro and announce any and announce any decisions which it makes Order. announce any decision which it makes at an appropriate time. That will follow in respect of Senator Hill's question as well as anything, anything else he asks. Senator West. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Tate, representing the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Services. And I ask, what is the government's response to a recent attack by the HCF in a letter to contributors on the National Health Strategies Papers Issues Paper No. 2, Hospital Services in Australia, Access and Financing, and the push by HCF for tax rebates for private health insurance contributions? Minister representing the Minister for Community Services and Health, Senator Tate. Mr President, the minister to whom you refer has of course seen a copy of uh, HCF's recent health report and the accompanying letter to contributors. And to be quite frank, Mr uh, President, it's a travesty of uh, misrepresentation. It, it uh, misrepresents all the options being presented for public discussion in that particular issue's paper referred to by Senator West. All options which are discussed in that paper aim to extend the overall level of choice available to hospital patients. The question of choice is uh, absolutely paramount. The importance of patients being able to choose their own doctor is emphasised by the National Health Strategy, and all options presented enhance choice in this regard, and that is exactly what you would anticipate. It is therefore a blatant misrepresentation for HCF to claim, and I use their words, that if this strategy were adopted, Canberra could decide not only which doctor would treat you, where you could be treated and when, but even whether you would be treated at all. Now that's just scaremongering, that's just, uh, as I say, blatant misrepresentation, and uh, no credit uh, attaches to HCF for the publication of this misrepresentation. What has been put together in issues paper number two are simply options. They have been presented for public debate, and any assertions with respect to future government policy are therefore, of course, highly premature. HCF's actions simply amount to a cynical attempt to scare people into taking out private health insurance. By pushing the concept of government subsidy through tax rebates, HCF is attempting to further subvert sensible public debate on the options in order to protect its own vested interests in the current arrangements. Senator Peniza. President, my question without notice is to Senator Button representing the Prime Minister. I refer the Minister to the call by the Minister for Trade, Mr Blewett to the Prime Minister to contact European leaders requesting that they strengthen their resolve on the Uruguay round of talks. I ask the Minister, can he assure the Senate that the Order. government will not accept a Uruguay round outcome that does not give real and substantial reduction in agricultural protection? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Button. Mr President, the uh, Uruguay round negotiations have reached a uh, uh, very uh, sensitive and uh, important stage with uh, uh, major discussions and uh, possible conclusions, hopefully, uh, being reached at uh, meetings tomorrow. Um, Senator, you ask in the second part of the question, will the government decline to accept an unfavourable outcome for the Uruguay round? If I might say so, though this government has been diligent in pursuing the Uruguay round, particularly in the interests of the uh, primary producers of this country and levels of agricultural subsidy and protection. Though we have been diligent in that, uh, I must say that the question suggests a misunderstanding 
of Australia's position. We've been diligent in doing that through the Cairns Group, for example. But uh, the outcome of the Uruguay round, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, I, I can't myself see any point in saying uh, we will not accept it. Uh, uh, Australia is not quite in the position of saying we'll accept this or we will not accept that. Uh, simply because, as you know, Senator Beniza, the vice, the great vice in, uh, in the uh, agricultural trade throughout the world is subsidies in Europe and North America. And the essential negotiations, of course, uh, involve an agreement between Europe and North America in relation to subsidies, to a lesser extent Japan in relation to subsidies on, uh, or, or protection of agricultural products such as rice. So uh, I think it is proper to say, Senator, that though we as a government have done everything that is available to us and will continue to do so, it is not a question in the totality of the Uruguay round of uh, saying Australia will accept this or Australia won't accept that. If the outcome of tomorrow's discussions and the next few weeks' discussions is unsatisfactory, then of course the Australian government will pursue further, uh, further talks. If that's the intention of your question, uh, that's, uh, that's an undertaking which I can give you. Uh, Senator Zakharov. Thank you, Mr President. My question is addressed to Senator Ray, representing the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Can the Minister advise the Senator the outcome of the third review conference of the Biological Weapons Convention, which was held in Geneva during September? Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Ray. Oh, Mr President, uh, the recent third review conference of the Biological Weapons Convention made very real progress towards uh, strengthening the treaty. It was a conference in which I'm happy to say Australia played a pro prominent part. The BWC is a major multilateral disarmament agreement concluded in 1972 to outlaw biological weapons. Membership of uh, BWC now totals 118 countries, including Australia, while a further 21 countries have signed the convention but not yet ratified it. The major measures agreed by the conference to strengthen the treaty included agreement to the establishment of an ad hoc group of government experts to examine verification mechanisms. The group will meet for the first time in March April 1992 and report to the state's parties by the end of 1993. Clarification that the scope of the convention include biological agents relevant to plants and animals, not just human beings. Mr. President, there was agreement on additional confidence building, me confidence building measures as well as reaffirmation of existing uh, confidence building measures. New measures agreed included the declaration of past biological weapons research and development programs, both offensive and defensive, and the declaration of human vaccine production facilities. At the conference, Australia played a leading role in forging agreement that any transfers of, rel of relevance to the BWC should only be authorised when the intended use is for the purpose is not prohibited under the Convention, and working successfully to have the conference call on developed countries to adopt positive measures to promote technological transfers to the developed world. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Mr. Uh, President, this group, uh, there was a group, uh, the, the group is an informal alliance of 22 Western countries looking at this issue, formed by Australia in the mid 1980s, which introduced controls on the export of chemicals which had potential use in the manufacturing of chemical weapons. The group meets regularly under Australia's chairmanship to discuss chemical and biological weapons issues and to harmonise uh, and review export controls. Senator Kerno. My question is to Senator Collins, as Minister for Aviation, and I refer to the various press reports concerning the apparently precarious financial position of Compass Airlines. I ask the Minister to explain to the Senate and to the tens of thousands of Australian families who have prepaid their airfares for travel over the Christmas period how many passengers are involved. Has the matter of a financial bailout of Compass Airlines been discussed between the government and Compass? What is the government's position in relation to bailing out Compass or any other airline? And finally, given that the government and the opposition have created the deregulated aviation environment, which will allow airlines to fail at massive costs to the Australian economy, isn't the predicament of Compass Airlines and its passengers simply the inevitable outcome of deregulation in a very small market? The Minister for Shipping and Aviation supports Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, 
If I could uh, take the three parts of um, Senator Curnow's question uh, first before I just make a general uh, statement about the current situation. Um, in respect to the first part of the question, that is how many, um, Compass Management have advised me that uh, there are approximately 125,000 passengers who have prepaid bookings with Compass over the next six weeks and the majority of those are return bookings, in other words, Christmas travel. Yes, it is uh, true that uh, we had a meeting with Compass Airlines uh, who put uh, some requests to the government. Um, I don't think it's relevant, actually, uh, nor I think is it proper for Compass, which is a private company, to discuss the details of that meeting. But I certainly have no hesitation in saying that the government uh, will not be uh, pre-purchasing uh, significant blocks of uh, of prepaid tickets from any airline, uh, nor will it be providing uh, personal loans to any airline. I mean, we deregulated airlines deliberately uh, to, uh, in fact, uh, remove ourselves from that situation. In respect to the last part of Senator Curnow's uh, answer, senators may or may not have noticed, uh, but I have been taking a consistently cautious line on deregulation precisely for the reason that Senator Curnow advanced. That is the very small size of the Australian market. Senators would know in here that I have been saying this in question time now for months, and in fact I think I can probably find it, uh, only a week or so ago when attacking the opposition's ridiculous uh, aviation policy in its GST package, which, which can I remind, which can I remind honourable senators, Mr President, involved dumping large numbers of international flight seats and reducing prices. I did indicate that you could not possibly get prices any lower than they were at the moment, and I was seriously concerned, and I've been saying this for six months, about the depth of the discounting that was being offered by the airlines, because they were in fact offering seats for significantly less than it was costing them to produce them. But can I just say that is absolutely a matter for the commercial judgment of the airlines concerned. Now, last night, Compass Airlines were in dispute with the owners of their aircraft. That dispute regrettably resulted in delays in the departure of some Compass flights. It potentially involved uh, the uh, stranding of a very large number of passengers, particularly at Sydney and Melbourne airports. Fortunately, that was averted uh, last night by discussions between the airline and representatives of the owners of the aircraft, and Compass have advised me that all passengers were carried last night. Uh, I might add, Mr President, that we stood ready last night through the manage FAC management at the airports to have provided emergency assistance in the form of food and, uh, and assistance with, uh, with sleeping arrangements and so on for passengers uh, should it have been required. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't. As I've said, Compass is a private company. The responsibility for its operations and, in particular, the responsibility for its passengers uh, reside uh, properly with Compass. But we are, uh, of course, obviously concerned about these uh, events and we're closely monitoring the situation. And if I could just conclude, Mr President, by advising the Senate of the most recent developments with Compass, because I think it's important that people know this. A, uh, an officer of Compass Airlines, uh, the assistant uh, manager, customer, vice president of customer services, said on Perth Radio this morning, and I quote, the situation is that we are taking bookings and ticketing people today and tomorrow. Beyond that, we are not ticketing people, but we are taking bookings. That has been put out to all our staff, and, that are the, and they are the instructions under which our, all our staff are operating on. And the last advice I have, Mr President, is that legal action commenced this afternoon in the federal court in Sydney at 12.30. Uh, the matter has been adjourned uh, for further consideration by the court at 9.30 on Monday morning next. Senator Schott. Supplementary, Senator Kerner. Uh, thank the minister for his answer, but uh, I just want to address the last part of my question and ask you what could be the long-term cost of, of this failure in terms of how much has Compass borrowed both onshore and offshore to set themselves up in the first instance, because we end up paying for that in the long term. Minister, Senator Collins. Mr President, as I've already explained, uh, uh, first of all, that Compass is a private company and it is entitled uh, to work out its, uh, its affairs in a commercial manner. I can't answer that question. And might I also say, Mr President, um, the, the company currently is in a legal dispute with the owners of the aircraft. Um, that matter is currently being uh, adjudicated in the courts, and as I've said, uh, the, uh, the hearing has been uh, now listed uh, for 9.30 Monday morning. Senator Shot. Thank you, Mr President. My question uh, is to Senator Ray, uh, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. 
Since the end of the 30-year war between Eritrea and Ethiopia in May of this year, can the minister provide details on what assistance Australia is providing to Eritrea? And can the minister also provide details on the prospects for a plebiscite in Eritrea to determine its future status? Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Senator uh, Thanks, Senator Shop, for his question. Uh, you know how to spell my name when I'm chasing the Nobel Prize later on, don't you? <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I did have minor notice of this particular uh, question uh, from Senator Schott. And may I say, in response uh, to the suffering experienced throughout Ethiopia as a result of the famine and civil war, Australia provided significant refugee relief and emergency assistance package in 1991. This included assistance amounting to $3.8 million for Eritrea. Even though the fighting has ended, the suffering continues. With this in mind, consideration has currently been given to a similar package of assistance for 91-92, which will be made up of Australian-sourced food aid and funding for the airlifting of relief food, ag agricultural rehabilitation and health services. Assistance will continue to be challenged through Australian NGOs. Uh, provision has been made in the 91-92 uh, country program budget for a contribution of $270,000 for an eye lens factory to be established near Eritrea. Some additional assistance for this factory is envisaged. It is also expected that a small number of in, in, in Australia training awards will be made available to Eritrea in 91-92. Following the fall of the Mengistu government in June of this year, the Eritrea and People's Liberation Front established a provisional government in Eritrea. It is subsequently agreed between the transitional government of Ethiopia and the provisional government of Eritrea that a, re a referendum on the future relationship between those two countries would be held within two years. There is no firm date yet being set for that referendum. The Australian government is not aware of any plans by the provisional government of Eritrea to hold an, any elections in advance of that referendum. Senator Niles. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. Why has the uh, Health Insurance Commission seen fit to further waste taxpayers' money by sending a kit listing the new schedules of fees to each individual doctor in Australia and to every one of their locations of practice? What was the cost of this gross and unnecessary exercise? Why did the Health Insurance Commission send 10 or 20 books Order. to each practice? And is, it, is uh, waste such as this the reason why the co-payment was introduced in the first place? And now, having wasted the money, is the government, led by either Mr Hawke or Mr Keating, now going to remove the co-payment? Minister representing the Minister for Community Services and Health, Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I don't have any particular knowledge of the kit that apparently has been distributed to uh, doctors and uh, those who uh, require to know the schedule of, uh, of benefits. I take you to talk about the Medicare benefit schedule, Senator. Uh, but of course, it's extremely important and has been a subject of comment uh, in this chamber from time to time that this sort of information be made available in a readily accessible and uh, an easily uh, readable form for practices as soon as is possible. And there have been complaints from time to time in this chamber where that information has not been made available. But, Senator, of course, the opposition will overcome any problem about having to notify doctors and uh, GP surgeries and uh, health care providers. Of, uh, of the Medicare schedules, because all you'll have to do is rely on the AMA to circulate their schedules, because that will become the benchmark, that will become the fee which every person who enters a doctor's surgery in Australia for primary health care will have to pay, because of the deal that you have engineered between the AMA and the private health funds, so that uh, through insurance, Australians, when they present themselves at a surgery for a consultation, will have to uh, provide the fee charged by the AMA, $31 Order. per consultation. That's what you have in mind. So, Senator, you'll simply have to rely on the AMA, of course, to distribute the schedule. That'll be your answer. Supple as to co-payments, as to co-payments, or co-payment, you see, Senator, you made the error, of course, of speaking about a co-payment. There are, in fact, two co-payments, two co-payments, depending on whether the GP bulk bills or not. What you are going to do, as disciples of choice, of course, is forbid, is to forbid, not permit, a GP to bulk bill his patients unless, of course, they are uh, pensioners or cardholders. You are going to take away that choice from uh, GPs. You are going to say they are not allowed to bulk bill Australians as they present themselves for uh, consultation at their uh, surgeries. 
you're going to take away that choice. So uh, you've even got your uh, question, the premises of your question wrong, Senator. There are in fact two co-payments depending on bulk billing. And that is a choice which many doctors want to continue to make, and you're going to forbid them from making that choice. Senator Null, supplementary. Mr President, can I now ask the minister to answer the question which is what was the cost of sending this information to every doctor at every surgery that they have, and in some cases sending 20, 10 or 20 books to each practice? And why was it done? But more importantly, what was the cost? Minister, Mr. Mr. President, Senator I'm quite happy to find out what the cost was, but the cost of providing this sort of information would uh, be a part, obviously, of, of providing necessary information to doctors in their practice. That is a, that is a cost which doctors would expect to be undertaken by government in the provision of this very important information. Senator Maguire. Thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to Senator Peter Cook, the Minister for Industrial Relations. I refer to my question without notice on the 9th of September last on the uh, New Zealand shearers working in the Australian wool industry. I ask the minister, is he aware of continuing concerns being expressed uh, regarding the employment of New Zealand shearers in the Australian wool industry? And uh, what was the outcome of the proposed random, inspe uh, random inspections referred to in the answer of the 9th of September to ensure the conditions of the federal shearing award are properly observed? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Senator Maguire is, uh, is referring to a practice uh, apparently promoted by the NFF to employ shearers on uh, false uh, contracts or contrived contracts below, below the, uh, the legal rate of the shearing award. And it appears that the uh, shearers that are being uh, used in this circumstance are recruited not uh, from Australia but from New Zealand, uh, which of course is uh, these days a third world economy. But they're being used illegally to break down the living standards of Australian shearers and coincidentally to, uh, to afflict considerable damage on the rural economies in some country towns where shearers are a uh, reasonable percentage of the population. But the, uh, uh, Senator Maguire asks what has uh, happened uh, within uh, my department to uh, deal with this problem. And my department advised me that there has been discussions uh, between the Australian Workers Union, the Shearing Contractors Association. Uh, my office has been represented in uh, these talks and the Department uh, of Industrial Relations. In order to identify who the potential uh, or uh, suspected offenders are and to establish a strategy to apprehend them and prosecute them, prosecute them for Order. breach of a lawful award, Order. The, uh, the awards management branch of uh, my department would be the responsible one. It will conduct random sweeps in the areas where it is believed these shearers are employed, ensure compliance with the lawful terms of the award, and it will uh, commence uh, Senator Maguire uh, uh, reasonably shortly. Uh, in the discussions that uh, we've had, too, other questions have, ra have been raised which affect other ministers. For example, questions of taxation evasion and uh, questions of social security fraud have been raised as well. I am writing to uh, my colleague, the Minister for Social Security, about the social security uh, aspects of this, and my colleague, the Treasurer, as well, to see what can be done to prevent uh, any derogation from lawful standards in Australia, not only in industrial relations, but social security and tax payment as well. Senator Crane. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, my question without notice is to the Minister of Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Minister, on the 9th of September, 101 days ago, on the 17th of October, 63 days ago, and on the 12th of November, 37 days ago, you said that you were preparing a statement in answer to my accusations that on the 9th, 10th and 11th of September and the 17th of October you misled the Senate when you took an inaccurate brief from your mates in the Seamen's Union and attacked the export award-winning Robe River. Yeah. I ask you, Minister, well, ask when question. are you going to have the courage to acknowledge your errors and apologise to the Senate and Robe River? Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Order. Senator Cook. Thank you. Uh, well, it may, it may well be that uh, the Senator Winston Crane has been his bonnet about this matter. I, I repeat once again for the record, although there's no need for me to once more say it, I don't think, that I have not misled the Senate in any way. 
but uh, the two because the two assertions the two assertions that I have made is that Robe River is a rotten employer, and uh, and I still hold that view, and I don't mislead you about the conscientiousness with which I hold that view. Order. And I think it's entirely appropriate for uh, me to be able to make that statement. This government has not shirked the task of identifying rotten unions when they've arisen. We, in fact, moved to deregister the BLF because we thought its activities were beyond the pale. And, uh, and, and we did so. So uh, I think we can say with, uh, with some degree of, uh, of uh, respect for our position that when an employer conducts themselves in an antisocial way, they too should not escape condemnation. And the other thing that I have made, upon which uh, I do not mislead the Senate, is that uh, Robe River, in my view, is a vexatious litigant in terms of, uh, of uh, industrial relations law. And the uh, example of that is no better example than the one I've given about where, after several appeals on uh, frivolous and uh, minor matters in the main, not all were frivolous and minor, some were substantial, but on frivolous and minor matters, the wholly owned subsidiary of Robe River, the company employing seamen, then went into voluntary, voluntary liquidation, and now a new company uh, has been, uh, has been uh, created in order to get the contract and thus set at naught all the rights of the employees of the wholly owned subsidiary. I regard that, I regard that, and I mislead you Order. not, I regard it conscientiously as vexatious litig litigation by Robe River in order, in order to avoid dealing with the issue of proper industrial relations in their company. And uh, I am, uh, I am uh, if I might say this, offended by some of the remarks that spokespersons for this company have made about their intentions in the conduct of good industrial relations in this country. This government has been supporting a cooperative approach in the, in the Australian workplace between employers and workers to generate higher productivity. And I have cited in this chamber on several occasions numbers of agreements where that uh, type of them and us, boss worker, employer employee relationship has been broken down and a team approach has been substituted willingly by all. What do Robe River do? Robe River say that unions should be excluded from the workplace. Robe River say, and I have the text of a speech here, that people should come to work every day frightened that they will be fired. That, that, is, that, is, a direct, that is a direct quote from a speech by Order. the chief executive of this company. Order. They should come to work every day frightened that they will be fired. Only then, only then will they act in the workplace in a responsible manner. I have to say, Mr President, that is, a, uh, that is a shocking indictment of the type of attitude yeah, yeah. this authoritarian company has to its, uh, its greatest asset, the people that work for it. Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr President. I address my question to the Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. The Minister will be aware of the recognition of the Lotus Glen Correctional Centre by the Human Rights Commission as a Queensland prison administration dedicated to fully implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. In view of the tragic death yesterday of the second member of an Aboriginal family to die in custody in Geraldton, can the Minister report on efforts to have all state ministers fully account for their policies in upgrading conditions and personal security for Aboriginal prisoners? Is the Attorney-General's Department initiating any co coordination of a national approach to this responsibility? Minister representing the Attorney-General. Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, it's always, of course, a terrible tragedy when uh, there is a death in custody, whether it is of an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal Australian. Uh, and in the particular latest instance, of course, I would want to express the sympathy of all those members of the Senate uh, with, uh, for the family of, uh, of the uh, Aboriginal who did die in custody. Uh, that is a matter which uh, I think causes us all to reflect on the way in which uh, Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders are represented in our prison cells, uh, police cells, prison populations, out of all proportion to the numbers in the general Australian community. And if me me methods can be found to divert uh, such uh, persons from uh, that type of incarceration, uh, then of course those methods should be pursued most vigorously. And I believe that uh, as a result of the Royal Commission 
into Aboriginal deaths in custody, Mr. President. Uh, those sorts of measures are being undertaken in a very cooperative way by uh, the Commonwealth with the states. And in fact, only a couple of days ago, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr. Robert Tickner, was able to announce uh, a, a uh, funding of some six and a half million dollars of various projects submitted by the states with a view to reducing the incidence of such deaths in custody, whether it be simply to do with the design of police cells, as I believe is the New South Wales submission uh, in uh, some outback uh, and provincial uh, cities uh, in, in the design of their police cells, or in relation to the fundamental uh, social and cultural uh, causes of the incarceration of so many uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in custody. Mr President, I think that uh, Senator Reynolds also adverted to the fact uh, that uh, some of the states—in fact, I think all the states are showing goodwill and good faith in these matters—but uh, already the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission has found it possible to make an award to uh, a prison, I think, near Cairns. Senator, I just, uh, the name escapes me for the moment, where, in fact, that particular prison, because of the regime uh, which operates there, which uh, relies on uh, uh, the inmates taking responsibility uh, for much of their own uh, uh, care, uh, that in that situation uh, that is regarded as a model for the way in which uh, such incarceration should occur. And I believe that that particular uh, prison, having received that award from the Human Rights Legal Opportunity Commission, certainly does provide a model, probably not merely for other uh, Australian uh, prisons and police cell situations, but possibly of an international significance. So, Senator, yes, much is happening in, in this uh, field and one would hope that it can reduce the incidence of deaths in custody. Supplementary, Senator Reynolds. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Senator Tate. I wonder, in view of your response, if uh, you could ask the Attorney-General uh, if he could report to the Senate on whether his department has responded to the unanimous resol resolution of the Senate last month urging state prison authorities to regard Lotus Glen as a model in implementing Aboriginal culture into its uh, rehabilitation programs, and whether the Attorney-General can report to the Senate on how uh, that intention of the Senate is being implemented. Minister Senator Tate. Well, Mr. President, I'll certainly seek that information uh, from the Attorney General, but I would say uh, it's even more important that uh, the uh, resolution passed by the Senate uh, expressed a view which coincides with the assessment made by the Human Rights Legal Opportunity Commission and led to the award being made, because I believe uh, in that way one has the independent uh, verification outside of government circles of uh, what a worthwhile project that has been and what a model it provides for uh, uh, the situation where Aboriginals or Torres Strait Islanders find themselves either in police cells or uh, prison custody. Senator Watson. My question is directed to Senator Button. His capacity is representing the Treasurer. And I refer to the depreciation changes in the industry statement of 12 March and the lack of supporting legislation for now over nine months. Is not the Minister concerned of problems to corporations balancing on the 31st of December this year, a balance date in lieu of the 30th of June? in view of the lack of uh, adequate legislative base. And what steps does the government propose, or what advice can the minister give, for December balancing corporations, which now must make a, an instalment deduction in January 1992? Further, has the minister's department, DITAC, had the opportunity of reviewing such legislation in its draft or final form? And can the Senate be assured that the inconsistencies revealed in the joint Treasury DITAC ministry statement regarding effective life of an asset be removed from this legislation. Minister representing the Treasurer. Senator Barton. <coughs> Mr President, I thought Senator Watson might have been kinder to me in the day of the sittings before Christmas than to ask me a question about tax. But uh, it's intelligent, Senator, of you, and uh, I, I will a number of a number of the matters in your question. I'll have to direct, uh, of course, to the Treasurer. The legislation, the legislation to which you refer, was introduced into the House of Representatives today. I understand, and uh, that will give you an opportunity to look at it. But insofar as there are some uh, detailed questions uh, directed to me, I'll address those to the Treasurer. Uh, certainly, my department did have uh, some opportunity to uh, have an input into the uh, draft legislation. As soon as, uh, as soon as I get an answer from the Treasurer, I'll give it to you. Senator Bell. Oh, yes, it's 6.30. 6.30. Uh, 
My question is addressed to Senator Cook, the Minister for Industrial Relations. I ask, is the Minister aware that on or about November 14, Australia Post implemented a set of guidelines for the conduct of surveillance of employees in relation to claims for compensation made under the CERC Act 1988, and that these guidelines were lodged with the Privacy Commission. I ask, were these guidelines drawn up in consultation with Comcare, and if not, why not? If the guidelines were drawn up with the assistance or knowledge of Comcare, are they consistent with any guidelines adopted by Comcare? And if not, what action will the minister now initiate to ensure consistency as required, by, uh, as required under the Commonwealth Compensation and Rehabilitation and Compensation Act? I ask, are the Australia Post guidelines consistent with the operation and intention of the CERC Act? And I ask, does the minister regard the action and conduct of Australia Post in using surveillance practices to gather information to be used against people claiming compensation as a legitimate practice consistent with the intention of the CERC Act? Order. The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Could I just point out to honourable senators, I think some of these questions are too long from both sides. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I agree. It's too long. And uh, if there were fewer questions, I'd answer them more quickly. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I also uh, say I, uh, I thank Senator Bell for giving me notice of this question, but then not asking it, asking a slightly different one. The, uh, the old trick. Uh, the <laughs> I am aware, I am aware of, uh, Mr. President, of guidelines for surveillance uh, in Australia Post and Telecom, and I'm, a, I'm aware that the guidelines used by both those uh, uh, enterprises and the guidelines used by Comcare itself have been developed in consultation with the Privacy Commissioner. Uh, that was referred to in one of, the, uh, one of the questions asked. The second round of consultative processes I am advised with the Privacy Commissioner uh, has been completed recently. The guidelines specific to Australia Post and Telecom include provisions in relation to a code of ethics applicable to investigators, and might I say that I am, I am advised uh, in the general field of workers' compensation investigation that there is a code of ethics for private investigators used by insurance companies uh, in that uh, area in order to see that the ethical behaviour in investigations is properly observed. But this, uh, these guidelines for uh, Australia Post and Telecom have an inbuilt code of ethics for investigators that ensure confidential confidentiality of information, ensure physical security of relevant records and the physical destruction of those records once the particular matter under investigation has been resolved. With regard to Comcare, the guidelines contain the same provisions as those for Australia Post and Telecom. I'm advised that the current practice is that surveillance is only used in the most limited of circumstances and then only with the express agreement of Comcare's chief executive officer or deputy chief executive officer. Can I say, uh, Mr President, that uh, in the field of workers' compensation investigation, uh, it is, uh, I think, a very sensitive matter, the way in which um, investigations are conducted, to my personal knowledge. I do know of cases in the private sector where I think there have been uh, techniques of investigation used which abuse the privacy of the individual and, in fact, uh, entrapment uh, of the individual as well, and I think that, uh, or attempted entrapment, which, uh, and, and the extraction of, uh, of statements uh, when a worker is in, in, in an injured state or in a state of shock recovering from an immediate incident giving rise to an injury. And all of those are deplorable. Uh, from a government point of view, uh, however, we, we take the view that uh, it is uh, naive and, uh, and wrong to assume that in every case there ought not be uh, uh, in, in, that every case is somehow uh, not worthy of fuller investigation. Some cases are, because the sad truth is some people do in fact try and manipulate workers' compensation. Nowhere near the number that is often pretended to be the case, but uh, there is a small element that that is, uh, that that is true of, and, then, and we need to safeguard against that. But as a general rule, as a general rule, uh, uh, surveillance is not is not availed of, and uh, where it is in that minority of cases, I think the proper safeguards are in place to ensure it's done appropriately. Senator Perra. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question without notice is directed to Senator Button, the Minister representing the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. As Australia continues to wallow in the recession we had to have, with unemployment at its worst level for 60 years, what hope can the Minister give the one million jobless plus the emerging school leavers for their prospects over the next 12 months? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Button. Well, Mr. President, that is, that is of course, a, uh, uh, another attempt to uh, derive emotional and, uh, emotional, emotional and political benefit. Emotional and political benefit. It's a cheapskate question. Uh, it, 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 it is a point of order. The minister is reflecting upon the motive, and quite improperly so, of the senator who asked the question. It should be asked to withdraw it. Senator Parr, if you'd been, if you, if, if, if you'd been sitting here as you have been day after day, you would know that we have a serious and tragic unemployment problem in this country. Serious and tragic. Yes. And, and you, you before Christmas, seeking to, ride, to derive as much as political comfort as you can from that situation. Get up and ask Get up and ask point of order. Pardon? I ruled on the point of order. I said there wasn't a point of order. Senator Button. You get up and ask that question in this circumstance. Now, <clears throat> let, me, let me give you this answer, because if you're going to ask political questions, you'll get political answers. And the political answer to this is this, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that in terms of this Christmas, the outlook for many people is very sad and difficult. In terms of in terms of, in terms of Christmas 1992, Order. in terms of Christmas 1992, the outlook will be better. If you get in, if you lot get into power in 93, in terms of Christmas 93, the outlook will be worse and worse and worse. And that is admitted by your leader, Dr. Houston, has, who has more intellectual honesty than the rest of you put together, because Dr. Houston has admitted that if your so-called package was introduced, unemployment would get worse. He's admitted that. And that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a political reality which you people have to front up to, instead of asking these uh, pathetic questions, trying to derive some comfort Order. from the situation before Christmas. Supplementary question. Supplementary. Senator Pera. I note, uh, Mr President, the uh, Minister's answer that the outlook will be better. And I ask him, what is the difference between the failed policies and strategies which brought about the recession we had to have and the current policies espoused by either the temporary Prime Minister or the Prime Minister in waiting? Minister Senator Button. Well, Mr President, I've asked and answered questions about uh, policies and uh, responsibilities for a very difficult recession on numerous occasions. Senator Perra either wasn't listening, he was probably yelling his head off at question time, or alternatively dozing one or the other. <clears throat> but I've answered questions about these policy issues time and time again. And I, I have said time and time again that this government, in respect of the application of monetary policy in 1990 and early 1991, accepts responsibility for a, response, a, a, a substantial part of this recession. But there are other factors involved in this recession in, uh, as well. There are factors such as the Huge rural, huge rural crisis which we have in this country, and I, I, no, I suppose I suppose you would say I, I suppose you would say that the wool crisis was in some way the responsibility of this government, would you? Well, I tell you, it's not. I tell you, it is not. And um, Senator, there are a number of other factors which have contributed to this recession in Australia. Now, let me say, let me say, people like you, don't Order. forget this. Don't forget that people like you could be asking the same, the same questions in the Parliament of the United Kingdom, the same questions in the Congress of the United States, the same questions in the Parliament of Canada. Don't let's forget that. This could have been done anywhere. Now, it's no good muttering away in your beard now. This is, that is a fact which you have to face up to. Senator Walsh. Mr President, my question is to Senator Tate representing the Minister for Health and Community Services. I ask, will the government accept the recommendation in the Wangman report, that's spelt with a G, Wangman report on childcare accreditation to spend an ongoing $3 million per annum
to fund this extra tier of supervision and regulation, or will it use the $3 million for enhanced fee relief to parents who need it? The Minister representing the Minister for Community Services and Health, Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I understand the Wangman report has been uh, released. It was commissioned by the Department of Health, uh, Housing and Community Services. It's, uh, it's been, I think, provided anyway, Senator, to the, um, accreditation, the Interim Accreditation Council to do with child care. You say it hasn't been released publicly, Senator? I'm not, uh, not sure Order. of that. But certainly. The intention uh, is that that uh, report simply become one of the working documents for the Interim Accreditation Council. And there's no intention of the government to hold us bolus uh, except uh, any recommendations in it without uh, the benefit of the uh, advice of that interim accreditation committee. So, Senator, there won't be uh, an immediate uh, uh, response uh, and there won't be, certainly, an immediate implementation of uh, any recommendations within the Wayman report because, as I say, it will become a working document of the interim accreditation council. And uh, uh, it's on the basis of the, of the recommendations from that council that the government will make its decision. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Richardson in his capacities as Minister for Social Security and representing the Minister for Arts, Sport, the Environment, Tourism and Territories. Why was the $6.2 million disability reform marketing strategy contract awarded over three months prior to the necessary legislation being passed by either House of Parliament? Why was $412,500 paid to the winning tenderer, Corporate Impacts, 24 days prior to the legislation being passed by the Parliament? And why was an additional $368,644.29 paid to the same company prior to this legislation receiving royal assent? Minister for Social Security, Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I shall uh, find out uh, some information for Senator Patterson. I can only point out that uh, the disability reform package was being uh, generally supported here. We weren't uh, locked in mortal combat. It was a massive change which affects the lives of people who are uh, dependent upon uh, an income provided by, uh, by the government. And uh, there obviously is a need for, for preparation uh, to be t undertaken early. Uh, but I'll uh, get some specific answers to the Senator's questions and try and get them to her next year. Supplementary. Senator Patterson. Minister, I'd like to know when you will give me the answers other than just next year, and can you assure the Senate that all due processes were followed in the letting of this tender? And I ask, is there any requirement or moral obligation of members of the Working Committee of the Ministerial Council awarding the tender to declare any conflict of personal interest in the matter, such as personal friendships with one of the tenderers? And if not, why not? Minister Senator Richardson. I, um I think uh, I, I'm actually not on the, that committee, the, uh, the government that decides these things. I don't think it's uh, uh, going to be possible to say that uh, amongst advertising agencies no one on the committee would ever have met anyone in, a, in a, uh, an agency, uh, although I'll ask, certainly uh, make an inquiry of, uh, of the committee and find out. Um, but uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't present, so I just don't know. Insofar as when I'll give you the answer. Well, normally, Senator Patterson, I'd give you the answer tomorrow. I suspect, however, uh, we won't be sitting then, so I won't be doing that. Uh, I'll endeavour to, uh, I'll endeavour to uh, give it to you very early in the new year. Hopefully, I, I'll be away for a few weeks, but uh, by the end of January, certainly. Senator Foreman. Mr. President, uh, my question is to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. I referred to an article in the Adelaide News on Monday which claimed that insurance companies were importing inferior replacement car parts and panels from Mal Malaysia and Taiwan, which could affect tens of thousands of South Australian jobs and elsewhere. It was also mentioned that this practice concerned unions and manufacturers because many of these parts did not meet the same standards as Australian products. Can the minister inform the Senate as to the accuracy of these claims, and is the government worried about this practice from an employment and safety perspective. The Minister for Industry, Pest. Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Well, Mr. President, uh, I'm not aware of the details of the case which uh, Senator Foreman asked me about. Let me say that from time to time allegations of a similar kind emerge, uh, usually from third parties claiming that imports 
uh, of this sort of uh, these uh, vehicles are, or parts are unsafe. And of course, the primary issue in these, uh, in respect of these things, has to be one of uh, safety. The Australian design rules uh, set down a comprehensive range of performance and design requirements for motor vehicle safety. Design rules cover a, a whole range of uh, safety requirements such as vehicle impact testing, side door strength, steering systems, other features to improve occupant protection and so on. The Australian design rules take uh, force nationally under the provisions of the Federal Motor Vehicle Standards Act, which is administered by the Federal Office of Road Safety. The Federal Office of Road Safety provides a mechanism by which alleged safety defects are investigated. If uh, Senator Foreman wishes to provide evidence of a safety problem, and I don't, certainly don't say it would not exist, I would be pleased to forward it to the appropriate authorities in the Department of Transport and Communications who administer the Motor Vehicle Standards Act. And I hope uh, uh, Senator Foreman will do that. Might I, might I say that uh, from time to time one receives complaints of this kind, and uh, I think it is always worthwhile following them up. Recently I received complaints about uh, compliance with safety, safety standards in respect of imported cranes and lifting platforms, predominantly used on building sites and in warehouses. And uh, <coughs> the arrangement with the federal government has been that uh, customs uh, would report any shipments of uh, cranes or uh, building lifting platforms and so on which were imported from overseas and that the state authorities in each case would inspect them and make sure they satisfied Australian safety requirements. Uh, my inquiries as a result of the complaint uh, recently reveal that that has not been done in most cases by the state authorities and I'm chasing that up at the present time. I think it's very important from the point of view of uh, the use of this equipment and so on if uh, if it is not, if the regulations are not going to be complied with, uh, those people who import these equipments ought to know that the government will consider banning them again. We don't want to do that. We think that's economically unsound, but uh, they should comply with the safety requirements of this country. Senator Lewis. President, my question is also directed to the Leader of the Government and the Senate, representing the present Prime Minister. And it's about the Uruguay round of GATT negotiations, uh, as to which I understand the agricult agricultural negotiations in fact end tomorrow. <coughs> I ask, firstly, uh, why it has been that during the last six months the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, has not been able to find time to ring any of the leaders of foreign countries, in particular the United States. Uh, President, the uh, France and Germany, in support of Minister Blewett's negotiations, uh, ultimately having to wait until Minister Blewett rang him up to please request him to do so. And then, secondly, I ask: have, uh, Has uh, the minister uh, seen the comments by visiting Professor Chalmers Johnson uh, that GATT is dead? Uh, in effect, because uh, of the end of the Cold War, he's suggesting that the GATT arrangements have been dead because they were the GATT arrangements were. He well, says this is another very long question, Senator Lewis. All right. Well, I won't read that out. I hope Senator Button's read that. I ask: Do you agree with his prediction that GATT is dead, and that the world is now entering an age of managed trade in which countries negotiate market shares directly with one another? Minister representing the Prime Minister. Senator Barton. Mr. President, insofar as the uh, first part of the question is concerned, it's true that the, it is hoped that the Uruguay round in respect of the agricultural negotiations will uh, reach at least a, uh, a seminal point tomorrow. Um, I uh, haven't seen the uh, uh, suggestion by Dr. Blewett that the Prime Minister should ring. Uh, the uh, appropriate uh, officials, presidents or prime ministers in US, France and Germany. Um, I would be very surprised uh, if during the course of this year the, the prime minister has not spoken to the president of the United States about this matter, but I'll investigate that and, uh, and obtain an answer for you. Um, it's not, uh, there is not uh, 
Senator, I think uh, uh, probably tremendous point in uh, Prime Minister taking action to speak with the French authorities. Uh, they are well aware of their position and they're well aware of ours and they've been, uh, that has uh, been made clear to them on numerous occasions. I think the United States is under no illusions about our position on farm subsidies either. Uh, <clears throat> I've not read the uh, current uh, comments by Professor Chalmers Johnson. Uh, uh, I've read uh, publications of his before about international business, and I must say they have a, uh, a fair degree of hyperbole and sensationalism about them, uh, the publications I've read on previous occasions. You know, Gat is dead is a sort of uh, a good slogan for selling a book, perhaps, but uh, <clears throat> it, it probably is, I think, uh, far from the reality. Insofar as the question of managed trade between blocks is concerned, uh, there has been a fair degree of managed trade between countries going on, for example, in ASEAN. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, heads of ASEAN meet in January to look at the question of. Uh, uh, not a trade block but a common external tariff for ASEAN countries. So those sort of things are happening in there and in uh, North America, uh, in Central America, uh, perhaps in uh, parts of Europe and so on. That leaves you sitting in front of Senator Lewis, whose question I'm answering. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the point is, Senator, that I think even within uh, a changed GATT regime arising from the Uruguay round, there will be a degree of managed trade going on. The lesser the better, but I think that will be likely to happen. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator Button, the Leader of the Government in the Senate, and it relates uh, to an answer he gave to Senator Walsh back on December the 5th regarding the wholesale sales tax treatment of road transport. And in that question, he uh, referred to the impact on transport costs as 2.8 per cent for road, 0.8 per cent for rail and 1.1 per cent for air. Could the minister firstly inform the Senate where he got those figures from? Secondly, could the minister inform the Senate if he considers the cascading effect of the high incidence of sales tax and fuel excise on road transport is one example of Australia's uncompetitive business tax system? Thirdly, does the minister agree that the this distortion between road, rail, sea and air places a dis disproportionate burden on the cost of grocery items? <laughs> Senator Collins, your, your answer is so long, I think I can ask Order. a detailed question to the minister. Places a disproportionate burden on the cost of grocery mm. items because most of these are transported on large articulated vehicles. And lastly, will the minister inform the Senate if the government is currently considering specific proposals to reform these inequities in the wholesale sales tax treatment <coughs> of road transport, or is the policy just the same as usual? If it, taxes move, if it moves, tax it, and if it keeps moving, tax it even harder. The Minister for Industry, Technology well, and Commerce, Senator Senator Barton. <coughs> That is, a, of course, a very long and detailed question to which I will uh, obtain a detailed answer. In respect of the uh, uh, the figures which uh, Senator Campbell asked about, uh, my recollection is that they were obtained from a Treasury uh, briefing on that matter. Um, so the answer as to where I got the figures from is there. Uh, I'm asked if uh, I recognise the cascading uh, effect of a wholesale sales tax. And the answer to that question is, of course, yes. Senator, you can remove uh, all. I mean, you can look around, and any any business tax that exists, of course, is a burden on business. I mean, uh, people say uh, payroll tax is a great and uniquely Australian burden on business. It, it is not uniquely Australian. All, uh, for example, all, all European uh, employers pay a social services levy. Uh, which is at least as uh, equivalent to the uh, value of the or the effect of the payroll tax uh, on Australian uh, businesses, and uh, arrangements, of course, vary from one country to another with the kinds of taxes which are imposed. Uh, insofar as the uh, uh, cascade effect on groceries, uh, I understand your sensitivity about this, Senator Campbell, because your tax taxes necessities for every Australian it taxes food. It taxes groceries, it taxes clothing, it taxes footwear, 
it, it taxes funerals, it taxes legal services, it taxes all those things uh, which uh, uh, the, the, the Australian. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting some support for once. Um, all those things uh, which uh, are burdens to ordinary families in Australia. I, I can't uh, precisely answer that part of the question now, um, but I would. Uh, <coughs> I would say that uh, I think the burden of the wholesale sales tax in respect, uh, in respect of groceries would be considerably less than the burden of a 15 per cent, uh, a 15 per cent goods and services tax. Mr President, I ask that further questions could... Uh, Reserve supplementary, uh, Senator uh, Mr President, I uh, thank the minister for, for saying that he received his figure from a Treasury paper. I ask the minister, as a supplementary, is he aware of the Treasury paper prepared for Mr Rick Charlesworth's caucus economic industrial relations committee on the 26th of November, which showed that the 2 per cent figure that he used actually refers to uh, fixed rigid trucks, that indeed the rate of WST incidents for transport is between 4 and 4.5 per cent on articulated vehicles, further that the amount of average tonne kilometres uh, for rigid trucks is only 57,000. And the rate for articulated trucks is 1.2 million. Would he agree then that he, he using figures which do not apply shows something like a one to one point a one to 1.5 billion dollar hole in the argument he used in December the 5th to Senator Walsh's question? Mr. President, Order, uh, Minister <coughs> Senator Button. Mr. President, because of uh, interjections from both sides of the House, I didn't uh, fully hear Senator Campbell's question. And uh, no, don't bother. Don't bother. I, I think because of the detail in it, Senator, I would be better to read the hands out over the uh, vacation period. I assure you, I, uh, I assure you, I'll do that avidly, Senator. I, I will do that avidly, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice, Mr. President. I li would like, while I'm on my feet, to uh, uh, to send my best wishes for Christmas to uh, uh, Jessica Bailey and her family who live near Young in New South Wales, and uh, I uh, ask that further questions be placed on this. Senator, just ministerial answers. Uh, Mr. President. Bye, bye, Robert. <laughs> Mr. President, um, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Point, or, order, order. I'm just about to find out. Mr. Question, but it was by, a by leave, I wanted to ask you a question relating to an undertaking Senator Button gave to you yesterday, but in light of the uh, comment that he just made, um, the question I want to ask I think also relates to that. It will just take a moment. Well, I'll, I'll ask the ministers to give their answers Mr. first, as uh, is the normal procedure. Senator Senator Bulkers. Bulkers. On the 4th of December 1991, uh, Senator Patterson asked me a question in my capacity representing the Minister for Higher Education and Employment Services. I uh, have now been provided with uh, an initial answer to that question. I seek leave to incorporate it in hand. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator Tate. Mr President, during the course of ADEX and soon after it, I received a number of questions about police actions at the site in the chamber and outside, as for example from Senator Reynolds. I also met a delegation comprising Senators Charles Spender and Valentine and two representatives of the ADEX demonstrators. Several of the allegations raised with me concerned purported actions by the police, and I undertook to report to the Senate on those allegations. I have received a report from the Chief Police Officer and have provided a copy of my answer to the relevant Senators. Because of its length, Mr President, I seek leave to incorporate the answer in hand, sir. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr President. My question relates to the uh, uh, answer that Senator Button gave to you, or said to you yesterday, where he claimed that he had sent to you a couple of— I got leave. Order. Where he claimed that he had sent you a couple of letters concerning the Order. conduct. No request for leave, as I recall. I did make a request for leave. Well, you better make it again. Order. 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 Is leave granted for Senator Bishop to make a statement? Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, Senator Button said that he had sent a couple of letters to you concerning the conduct in this chamber during question time. I ask you, Mr President, if you have received those letters, and if so, will you table them in the Senate? And in the interests of fair play and balance, 
I now seek leave to table some correspondence that I have received supporting the opposition's uh, efforts to bring the government to account and ensure that the government does not continue to abuse the procedures of the chamber, particularly at question time. Uh, Mr. President, I would seek leave to uh, either incorporate them into Hansard or I could read them. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. And then, Mr. Yeah, President, same. I would like to continue uh, my, uh, my free remarks and I would like to read them into the, into the record. President, I understood that she sought leave to ask you a question, not to make a speech. No, no I no, sought leave to make yeah. a statement. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to read them. If the minister will agree, I am happy to incorporate them or indeed table them. Otherwise, I will read them in. Is leave granted? Is leave granted for the letters? To be incorporated. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Thank you. Then I'll read them. Thank you, Mr. President. To Senator Bishop, uh, the date is the 9th of the 20, uh, 9th, 29 Senator Jackson Cook. Street, Newport, dated the 12th of December. Dear I, Senator, uh, keep up the good work. You order. Look point of order. Mr. President, uh, I don't want to uh, cut across anything that uh, the Senator Bishop wishes to do, but uh, well, no, I just want to claim my rights. Uh, I would like to uh, add to an answer that I gave during question time. No, no, no. This is this is ministerial answers. This is ministerial answers. Order. And I understand that takes prisons. Order, order, I order, Senator Cook. I gave ministerial answers. I'm sorry. Precedents, and uh, I didn't think there was anybody else standing. I'm sorry. And I call Senator Bishop. I'm now in the, a difficult position where I've been, where Senator Bishop asked leave to ask me a question. I don't think she. I think she needs leave to read these letters into the hand, sir. A statement. She asked leave to, uh, to well, ask me a question, we'll I believe. The second time was to make a statement. You conferred, the manager conferred with the leader of the government, and the answer came back yes, this is a statement. She then sought leave to incorporate letters. That has been refused, so she is continuing to make the statement and has the right to read the letters into the hands of Senator, the point of order, let me remind the Senator of what took place. Senator Bishop rose and sought leave to ask a question. And the question she asked was this. Senator Button said yesterday that he'd sent a couple of letters to you that he'd received in the post about the conduct in Senate. Will you, did you receive those letters and will you table them? That was the question. Did you receive those letters and will you table them? That was the question. Now, if you want to check the Hansard record, that was asked of the president. That, that was asked of the president. Now, that is a question for the president. Now look, the purpose of this is for Senator Bishop to put on a stunt, as usual. That's what it's all about. Everybody in this Senate received, everybody in this Senate received letters congratulating on their performance, but order. it's only you point of order. who wants to read point the point of order. Point, point of order. order. Uh, Senator Button has clearly moved on to uh, engaging in a bit of argy-bargy from the floor of the chamber. Speaking to the point of order, he simply recited the first part of Senator Bishop's statement. And I don't hear him to uh, challenge the proposition that Senator Bishop was given leave to make a statement, the first part of which involved the asking of a question, and she ought to be allowed to proceed as she has the call, and it's a sheer impertinence and reflection on the chair for Senator Cook to try and interrupt in the way he did. Order. 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 I think that, as far as Senator Cook was concerned, it was a genuine mistake. Order. <laughs> Order Senator, order Senator Bishop ask leave to ask me a question. No, I thought also a statement, Mr. President. Well, and I had, I did certainly. Did Lurch, watch it. Order. <laughs> order. Quiet, Lurch. Order. 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 I'm. President. Order. Oh, he's the chairman. Lurch has taken the chair. Order. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr President. I will, I will let Senator Bishop continue because I think that I made a mistake and said that Senator Bishop 
I gave a leave to make a statement as well as ask the question. I don't know whether Hansard could check that, but in the circumstances, I'll let it continue. Thank you. There are only three short ones. It's only a selection, Mr. President. Dear Senator, keep up the good work. You look wonderful on television. We feel so enlightened when you fight back. I am afraid that G. Evans and Robert Ray are a bone of contention with me, too. Had an unnecessary experience with Mr. Ray when I was scrutineering in Manly many years ago. He was cracked over the knuck I was cracked over the knuckles when I was not familiar with some papers on the counting table which I should not have touched. The ruler really hurt. A, uh, a headmaster at the table reprimanded him on the spot. I do belong to the uh, Newport branch, but not an active member these days. Yours sincerely, Joel of Page. Compliments of the season. Second letter from Mrs. Kazuko Little, dated December 91. Dear Senator Bishop, my sincere best wishes for your good work in Parliament. I watched on TV and it made me so angry with the practices. These Labor men, even the Speaker, any sensible people that watched that broadcasting will understand how unfair treatments of the Labor Party men were doing in their government's most important debating place. Your standing up in the session pointing out the Speaker and Senator Button is out of parliamentary practices were clearly seen by thousands of people in Australia. Keep up the good work, Senator, wishing you peace and happiness for Christmas and the coming year. Uh, this is uh, from Kingsgrove, from uh, uh, Mrs e Elizabeth Stead. Dear Senator Bishop, firstly, may I congratulate you on your performance in Parliament. I live on my own and always look forward to question time in the Senate. As you can always be seen so well informed, not only on the subject being uh, discussed, but on the correct procedure to be followed with the debate. Keep up the good work. We look forward to seeing you on the other side of the House in the near future. It is such, it is such a secure <laughs> feeling to see the Liberals united in their party. Point, point of order, Senator Reynolds. Point of order, Mr. President. Could, could I ask if, if this is a, a new standing order that is going to enable us all to make self-congratulatory speeches uh, on the afternoon before we go into recess? There's no point of order. If, you conduct, if, if your conduct and grooming is an indication uh, of how to show of how orderly Dr. Hewson's government will be in Australia. Australia is in for more orderly line of government. Having said all that, I was wondering if you could explain to me and my friend Senator Bishop how the GST will affect us, and she then uses personal items which I won't include. Yours faithfully, Mrs. Elizabeth Stead. P.S. Keep up the good work, Senator, in the House, and show how a better alternative is for all. Yeah. There's more if you'd like, Mr. Pre yeah. I, I would put on the record now, Mr. President, that there are more letters if, uh, if the uh, Senate would like. This was just a random selection, and I only brought them in because Senator Button told us he had any letters, but he couldn't produce them. <laughs> Order. I think this originally started out as a question to me. I've uh, received lots of letters about the conduct of question time. I received lots of telephone calls. I must say, over the last couple of weeks, they haven't been all uh, complimentary of either side of the chamber. Uh, I'll have a look at my records uh, when I get back to the office and make a reply. Whether or not Senator Button has actually sent yeah, you I'm those answering your question. and whether he had sent them on that particular date and not subsequent to today. Senator Crichton Brown. I seek leave to make uh, about a very short statement in respect to a uh, ruling you gave at question time. I don't propose, of course, to canvass, but I want to, the government give me leave for about one minute. Leave's granted. But during question Senator time, Brown. thank you, Mr. President. During question time, Senator uh, Pera asked a question of Senator Button in respect to unemployment and the prospects for the million people unemployed. And Senator Button, in his answer, reflected it in what I thought was the most grave way upon the motives of Senator Pera in asking that question, suggesting that Senator Pera enjoyed the misery of mass unemployment because it brought some political advantage to the coalition. And I took a point of order suggesting that under Standing Order 193 that Senator Button was reflecting upon the motives of Senator Pera, which is considered by that Standing Order to be highly disorderly. A new rule that wasn't a point of order. I, of course, wouldn't presume to canvass that ruling. I wonder would you be good enough to perhaps give consideration to the matter I raised and 
perhaps make a more definitive uh, ruling in due course for my clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Order. In reply to Senator Crichton Brown, I took the, uh, the comments that were made as a debating point. Uh, I will, however, have a look at how it appears in Hansard, and I will report back uh, to the Senate. Senator Cook. Can I add to an answer I gave during question time? Senator Cook. Uh, during question time, Mr. President, I was asked a question by Senator Winston Crane concerning Robe River and his allegation that I have in some form or way misled the Senate. Well, I haven't misled the Senate, Mr. President, but I uh, wish to add to my answer by now tabling a, uh, a document which is a history of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission's appeal cases by Cape Lambert Services since June 1989 and which lists by uh, C number each of those cases under the heading the case number of the proceeding, the nature of the subject, matter of proceedings, statements by Senator Crane and Hansard <coughs> and the outcome uh, in the commission in each of the, or in the uh, courts in each of those uh, in each of those cases and uh, I secondly want to uh, uh, put down a statement which is a history uh, of these cases and a, uh, a set of remarks that I mean I'm happy to read these mr. president but these are a set of remarks that I would make which uh, goes to the facts of these particular cases and it's a uh, longer document, and in deference to your rulings about the Senate, uh, I would uh, not propose at this stage to read it, but I, but I may wish to uh, at some other time. And I wonder if I can uh, seek leave to have these documents uh, incorporated in the Hansard. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Well, I seek leave to make a statement related. Well, I seek leave to move a motion to take note of what the minister has just said in his supplementary answer. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Mr. Hill. Mr. President, this is an incredible situation. What's just happened is, is that a few minutes before the end of question time, Senator Crane gave notice to Senator Cook that he intended to move to century. He gave notice because it's the proper courtesy which we, which we follow. To censure him for misleading the Senate in answers to questions on the 9th, 10th, and 11th of September and the 17th of October, Senator Crane indicated, reminded the Senate today, that the minister has been offering, promising to the Senate that he would put down a full statement explaining the answers that he had given, which Senator Crane has constantly said were factually incorrect. He first said he would put that statement down 101 days ago, and on several times, several occasions since, he has repeated that he would put down that statement. He has not done so. It now seems that he has been sitting on that information and did not intend to put it down because Senator Crane again asked him today whether he would do so, and all he, could, he, he, all he answered with was another attack reflecting a personal prejudice on a, this particular Australian company, Road River Limited, which is not relevant at all to the questions that Senator Crane has been asking, which related to whether or not Senator Cook had made errors in fact on a number of occasions in defence really of the original brief that he received from the Siemens, Siemens Union. So having been given notice that he was about to be censured, suddenly Senator Cook decided he had no choice other than to put down information that he's been, he's been sitting on. Now that's, that, is, that is an incredible way to do business. I remind you also, I remind you also Mr. President, that time and time again Senator Cook from the government benches has said to Senator Crane, I dare you to censure me. Come on, go on with it. Censure me if you've got the information. Put up or shut up. And with great patience, what Senator Crane has been coming back about once every month and doing as an alternative is to, to the minister is to say, on the face of this evidence, you have misled the Senate. The factual information that you have put before the Senate is wrong. I give you the opportunity to correct the record. Correct the record, apologise to the company and apologise to the Senate. But the minister wouldn't do that. He was hoping that this matter would go away, that Senator Crane would, would eventually uh, um, 
find that it, wasn't, uh, it, you know, it was too much trouble to continue with it. He had no intention of putting before the Senate the information that he has now been put, forced to put before the Senate because the alternative was that he would have to admit an error and apologise, which he is not prepared to do. A Senator Crane will take the sensible course of action now and not pursue the censure motion at this time. He will first peruse the documents that the minister has belatedly put down. But it is not a good way to do business. It demonstrates this particular minister's prejudice and the extent that he will go, that he will go to protect his prejudice, his lack of bone fight, as my colleague says. It does him no good. It does the standing of his government no good. And it's interesting on this day when the new Prime Minister is probably going to be choosing a new set of ministers that he would again demonstrate not only his prejudice and his incompetence. And I think what has this minister been already censured on two separate occasions yep. by the Senate, yep. uh, and this would have been a third occasion, almost, almost, almost exactly. unprecedented, almost unprecedented. It is a poor standard of behaviour from, from a minister. It is an insult to the Senate. It is an insult to Road River, and he still ought to get up and apologise for the way in which he's conducted his business in this regard. I would like, to, through you, Mr. President, I would like to add uh, some comments in terms of um, this matter. When I listen, first of all, through you, Mr. President, uh, to uh, the minister's answer, I was sceptical about the accuracy of it. I took certain actions in terms of getting the decisions, and I have a list of decisions from the Arbitration Commission as well, which will be interesting to compare with the minister's list to see if they coincide in those particular decisions. Through you, Mr. President, I have given you, Minister, four opportunities in this Senate to make a statement so as that the record was correct and accurate. It is not an issue about whether Robe River is correct or right or whether the union is correct or right. It's an issue about whether or not the information that was put down in this chamber was in fact accurate and reflected the true situation. That's what it's about, and I think it is absolutely despicable, deceitful and unforgivable that after having asked you again today that you in fact could not put that record down, that information you had, you had to come in behind uh, procedural matters. After all this, you didn't I'll, miss procedural be matters today the because you weren't aware of what was going on. You missed them because you were down at the other end of the chamber to the talking Democrats. to the Democrats. That's why you missed it. And I think it is absolutely despicable through you, Mr Deputy President, that we now have this situation before us. I certainly reserve my right to continue this particular matter. I will look with interest at those documents. I tried to give you the opportunity three months ago, now over three months ago, to make sure that this particular accusation was right about a company uh, in Western Australia, a company which you once again today uh, criticised. Maybe some of that criticism is justified, but that is not the point. The point is that in looking at these particular issues, in your responsibility as a minister, there must be even-handedness in the approach. In this particular case, there has not been even-handedness in the approach. And I believe what you have done today in terms of after question time, bringing that in and now putting it on the table, in fact has denigrated question time and the processes of this chamber. Senator Coulter. President, just very briefly, um, I was provided with some information through uh, Senator Hill last evening in anticipation of the, uh, the censure motion today. On perusal of it, it seemed to me that there was substantial evidence there that uh, the minister uh, had misled the Senate in, uh, in respect of uh, answers to questions. Uh, the um, brief tater tater I've just had with the minister to which Senator Crane referred to a moment ago uh, involved the minister saying to me that there was other evidence which he, he uh, sought to put before us. 
and I'm pleased to, uh, to note that the, uh, the opposition is, is not uh, proceeding at this time with its censure motion because I think it's only fair that we uh, have an opportunity to uh, look at both lots of documentation to see just where the uh, tr truth of this matter really does lie. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. There are a couple of things that uh, I should say by way of uh, threshold remarks on this before I go to the substance of the issue. The first is an, alle an allegation by uh, Senator Hill that I had no intention, an allegation he, re he reported, uh, repeated a couple of times, that I had no intention of correcting the record. In, in, on the many occasions that I have been asked questions on this matter, I have uh, almost on all of them, except I think for today, because I uh, got sick of uh, needless repetition, said that uh, I would correct the record in due course. This is not a matter of great substance. It is certainly not a matter high on my priority, because nothing in the record, uh, nothing in the record uh, derogates from the two conclusions that are the central propositions of my case. The central propositions of my case are, one, that Road River is a rotten employer, and two, that Road River is a vexatious litigant on matters of industrial relations. Nothing uh, here that's before the Senate now derogates in any way from uh, those contentions, and I in fact believe what is on the uh, record now of the Senate supports them strongly. So uh, to the point, though, that I had no intention, I did have an intention, and I would have fulfilled that intention. I would have fulfilled that intention by speaking, uh, as it was uh, in my mind to do, on an adjournment uh, uh, night, so that I could take the time to actually go through the record case by case. Now, I, now I, uh, I, uh, I. Uh, this is. Order. I, I'm just saying, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, I would have spoken on an adjournment because I needed a full half an hour. And uh, I didn't wish to detain the actual business, uh, the business time of the Senate by dealing with uh, these allegations. And I, I just think that it is wrong and indeed reprehensible that any backbencher can rise, make an allegation, no matter how well or ill-founded, and then, and then, Order. and then, Senator Panetta. and then expect that the whole ship of government is going to stop. And, uh, and deal with some allegation that comes that way. So it was my intention to speak on an adjournment and not detain the business of the Senate and the normal conduct of that business of the Senate. The second time is that there are a number of cases. Indeed, for anyone to make the allegation, as I have, and an allegation by which I stand, that a particular company is a vexatious litigant, re requires, requires that there to be a history of litigation. And there is. And there's a, a whole number of cases, and these cases have gone through the Byzantine coils of appeal uh, at uh, various levels of the Industrial Relations Commission and of the courts in this country, and, uh, and different outcomes at different levels of the appeal. So, in order to establish a factual outcome on the record, based on what actually did occur, is is by no means a short matter. It is a a long matter and requires and requires uh, that the documentation be clearly uh, set out. So uh, I might say, Mr uh, Deputy President, that I haven't proceeded thus far on an adjournment uh, speech to do this, but it is still my clear intention. It is still my clear intention to do this. And uh, well, I don't intend to do it tonight. I just happen to have some other things uh, to, uh, to be worried about. And this is, not, uh, this is not on my list of priorities the highest thing. But it, uh, it, will, uh, it will be dealt with. So to the first question uh, that has been raised by, by Senator Hill, that I had no intention, I say those things as, uh, as commitments I've given to the Senate and commitments for which I will fulfil. The second uh, question is this allegation of misled. The, uh, Senator Crane obviously got his name in the newspaper by making an allegation. Now, I happen to take my responsibilities as a minister of the Crown in this country as serious. The allegation of misled is a formal allegation in the Westminster system that carries with it, I think, considerable penalty for anyone that in fact does it. And, uh, 
And, and, uh, and I don't think that uh, it is one that, that simply should be traded by way of interjection or uh, allegation freely across the chamber unless, unless, there is, unless there is some substantial weight to them and unless people are prepared to act on their words. Well, I accept that Senator Crane is prepared to act now on his words because, as it is the uh, case uh, in what Senator Hill has said, I have certainly invited him to do so. And I'm pleased that now he's brought this matter to this, uh, to this point, and, uh, and maybe now we can uh, resolve this matter one way or, the, or another, uh, if not now, and uh, it's probably not appropriate that it be done now, but certainly sometime uh, soon in the next sitting period. Now, uh, Mr. President, uh, De Mr. Deputy President, I, uh, I say that the two essential contentions here are by me, one, that Robe River is a rotten company, and two, that Robe River is a uh, vexatious litigant. The, uh, on the first, can I say, my reasons for making that uh, assertion uh, are uh, very many in number, and the examples of why I have come to that conclusion are, if not only picturesque, uh, examples of a company taking uh, an attitude about its workforce, which I think, frankly, is reprehensible. And, uh, and I hold that assertion, and I continue to make that assertion. Uh, irrespective of anything that might have passed from the opposition. But I have not come to that conclusion because a union has asked me to come to that conclusion or because the Siemens Union, who is the aggrieved party here, has asked me to. I come to that conclusion independently of them and based on a survey of all of the evidence. And I say that this government has reserved the right to criticise unions and take actions against unions. There are two examples. We regarded that the building Builders Labourers Union was a reprehensible organisation and behaved itself in a disgraceful and unlawful way. We deregistered that union by legislation on two occasions. We regarded that, the, that AFAP, the uh, Pilots Federation, behaved, misbehaved itself in an improper way in an industrial matter uh, in terms of the pilots dispute, dispute some two years ago and as a government took action against them. Now, I think that a government, as opposed to a, uh, an opposition, a government has a, a responsibility to be fair and even-handed, and if it's dishing out punishment on one side, when on the other side of the industrial relations fence there is misbehaviour, it is bound in all conscience to speak out and identify that as unacceptable behaviour. And that's what I've done in the Robe case. The particular evidence that I've adduced is uh, now before the Senate. The, uh, the, the second matter about a vexatious litigant goes to the extent in which they have used the law to evade responsibility. There is a question of law and justice here. The law can be used by smart lawyers to delay the application of justice, and where, that is, where the law is, by resort to technical means, is used in such a way, it can in fact delay a proper outcome. I believe that to be the case in this, in this particular case. I believe that to be the case, and I think the record uh, uh, supports me, and the record supports me by uh, not only my view but by the view of any fair independent person inspecting the record impartially to come to a conclusion. Now, uh, uh, I, therefore, I therefore conclude my remarks, Mr uh, Chairman, on the point, on the point of that the Senate take note of my answer. If it is of a mind, and I do not uh, in any way, uh, uh, well, in fact, in some respects, look forward to this debate. Uh, if, if it, the Senate is of a mind to debate the merit of those claims and go to the facts and go to the detail, uh, I am happy and, in fact, uh, not only happy, uh, dripping in anticipation to do that. But I do not think it is an appropriate thing to do today, and uh, should the Senate be of that mind, when I, uh, when I can make my fuller explanation on an adjournment speech soon in the next sitting period, well, then I will be delighted to oblige. Question is the question is the motion be agreed to those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it.